a card. Let's read it. I wonder who it's from. Dear Jesse and Squeaks, we just got home from a big flying trip and we had so much fun. We wanted to give you both something to fly as well. Signed, Bill and Webb. Oh, that's awesome. Let's check it out. Oh, that's so nice of them. Oh, I would love to go fly our kite right now. But I'm sorry, Squeaks, we can't. I was just outside and there's not enough wind. Oh, well, we could go on a trip to find somewhere that's a lot windier. Do you have any ideas? No, oh, that's okay, Squeaks. Let's start by thinking about what wind is and how it's made. What do you know about wind? Oh, you're right. Wind is just moving air and there's air all around us all the time. But what makes it move? It has to do with temperature. When air gets warmer, it rises. And when it cools down, it sinks. If you're in a place where some air is warmer and some air is cooler, you'll have air rising up and air sinking down at the same time. And as all that air moves around, other air can rush in to fill its place, creating wind. Good question, Squeaks. Why isn't all of the air the same temperature? Can you think of something that might be heating up our air? <laughs> you got it. Just like the sun can warm you when you stand outside on a sunny day, the sun can heat the air up too. But the sun doesn't heat everything evenly. For example, places that are covered in bright white snow are good at bouncing heat away, while places covered in dark rocks are good at absorbing and trapping heat. And the shape of the land can affect things too. Land that's really flat can get the same amount of sunlight on every part, which means all the air will stay roughly the same temperature and won't move around much. But land full of big bumps can have very different temperatures, which means the air can too. That's because all those bumps can create a bunch of places where the sunlight can't reach. Just like you can cool yourself down on a hot sunny day by standing in the shade of a tree, standing in the shady parts of rocky places will feel cooler too. So if we could put these types of places together, we'd have a perfect recipe for making a really big wind. Can you think of any places like this? A place that's made of rock, but partly covered in snow, and its shape can make really big shadows. That's right, a mountain. And there's a mountain in the northeastern United States called Mount Washington that holds the record for the fastest gust of wind ever measured. Or at least one that wasn't part of a tornado or hurricane. <laughs> how fast? Oh, it was a lot faster than we get around the fort. Would you like to guess how fast the gust was? A hundred miles an hour? That would be about 160 kilometers an hour. That's a good guess. That's pretty fast. And every once in a while, we can see gusts of wind like that in the mountains around here. But it's not fast enough for the record. 231 miles per hour, or over 371 kilometers per hour. That's about three times faster than cars on the highway. <laughs> yeah, that'd blow me away too. <laughs> Mount Washington is located in the perfect place to make it super windy. It sits right where several huge blobs of moving air meet. Some are coming from other places above land, and some are moving toward the land from the ocean. And when all those different winds meet up, they push against each other and get stronger. But the shape of the mountain is important too. Mount Washington is very tall compared to other mountains in the area. It's also pretty steep. So when all that wind tries to move over it, the air gets squeezed, which forces it to travel even faster. And because the wind is so extreme up there, scientists wanted to study it. So they keep detailed records of how the wind speed changes over the course of not just a single day, but weeks, months, 
and years. And by keeping track of how windy it gets, they can find patterns in their measurements that will help them predict how windy it will be in the future. Take a look at this graph, Squeaks. It shows us the average wind speed for each month in the year based on measurements taken over the past 30 years or so. What do you notice about the wind speeds? Oh yeah, that's right. The average wind speed is faster in the winter and slower in the summer. So if you wanted to take a trip to the mountain, you could use a graph like this to help you plan ahead. Oh, that is an excellent question, Squeaks. He wants to know how people know how fast the wind is going. Well, scientists can measure how fast the wind is going with a special tool called an anemometer. There are many designs for anemometers. Some common ones are called vane, cup, and hot wire. Vane anemometers use a rotating blade to show what direction the wind is going. And by timing how fast the blade spins, it can tell you the wind speed. Cup anemometers work in a similar way. The wind is caught in the little cups and pushes them. The more times they spin around every minute, the faster the wind is. But I think the hot wire design is really clever. Electricity is used to heat up a wire. When the wind blows past, it cools the wire down. To know how fast the wind is going, scientists time how long it takes to cool the wire. The faster it cools, the faster the wind. And that's how Mount Washington's record wind was recorded. It is pretty cool. And what's even cooler is now there's an observatory up there, the Mount Washington Observatory, where meteorologists can stay safe while they learn how the winds up there can get so fast. <laughs> oh yeah, I can see why that name would be a little confusing. But meteorologists don't study meteors. They study the weather. They use scientific instruments like anemometers at Mount Washington Observatory to record things like the wind speed and temperature. <laughs> it can be dangerous to stay up there, but the wind isn't always that fast. Its average wind speed is closer to 35 miles per hour or 56 kilometers per hour, which is still fast enough to break small branches on trees or make it unpleasant to walk around, but not so strong that you couldn't go outside at all. But there's another place on Earth where the average wind speed is even higher. Commonwealth Bay, Antarctica. No, it's not a mountain. It's a big area along the coast of Antarctica. And the reason it's so windy there is different than Mount Washington. Commonwealth Bay is super windy because of the catabatic winds. <laughs> no, not cats and bats. <laughs> catabatic. Remember that cold air sinks? Well, the inner parts of Antarctica are super cold. So the air is too. But the ground is also higher up than it is near the coast. So all that cold, heavy air will naturally sink down toward the coast, like water flowing downhill. And unlike most other windy places on Earth, Antarctica doesn't have buildings or plants to slow the wind down. So it gets faster and faster until it reaches Commonwealth Bay. <laughs> On average, it's about 50 miles per hour or 80 kilometers per hour, almost as fast as a cheetah running at full speed. So maybe instead of thinking about the fastest winds we can find, we should figure out the best weather to go kite flying, huh? So you want there to be some wind, yeah, but not too much like on Mount Washington or Commonwealth Bay something in between five and 10 miles an hour or eight to 16 kilometers an hour. You also want it to be nice outside with no rain or snow falling and especially no lightning or thunder. But how will we know when the weather will be just right? That's right. We can check the local weather forecast to see what meteorologists predict the weather will be like around the fort for the next few days. Sure, Squeaks, we can go check that out now. Oh, what's wrong, Squeaks? 
Oh, is the rain making you sad? I know you're hoping to fly your kite today. Well, don't worry, buddy. I'm sure it'll go away soon. You know, Squeaks, there are a lot of places that are way, way rainier than the fort. It's true. Right now, all over the world, people are experiencing different weather. In some places, it's sunny and dry. In others, it's cold and windy. And in some places, it's even wetter than it is here at the fort. <laughs> and there's a good reason why. We all experience different weather because the places we live have different land and water features that make them unique. We're up high in the mountains, which makes it colder where we are than it is in some other places. <laughs> yes, and snowier in the wintertime too. Scientists measure the different weather patterns in all of these places to learn more about what makes them happen and how to predict future weather changes. And because of certain conditions, there are some places where it rains a lot. <laughs> Ooh, great question, Squeaks! Scientists can measure how much rain a place gets by collecting some of the falling water. They can't catch it all at once, so they use an object called a rain gauge to gather the rain in a small area. Then they figure out how much water fell, usually by measuring how many millimeters high that water is in their gauge. Then researchers can look at how much rain those places see over long periods of time. And they can use that information to identify the rainiest places on Earth. Do you want to learn about a couple of them? <laughs> awesome! Let's take a look. There's a place in Hawaii called Mount Waialele, which has the record for the most rainfall over 60 years. The average amount of rain they got in that time was 9,500 millimeters per year. That's twice as tall as a giraffe. Yeah, and it has been even higher at times too. The rainiest year they've ever seen was 1982, when they got more than 17,300 millimeters of rain. So if we ever go and visit Mount Waialele, we'll need to bring our rain boots for sure. <laughs> Great question, Squeaks! There are a few things about Mount Waialele that help make it so rainy. For starters, it's on an island that's farther north than the rest of the Hawaiian Islands. And because of that, it tends to be the first one to get hit by moving storms. The mountain is also surrounded by valleys on three sides. And these valleys help push storm clouds right up to the mountain itself. Kind of like when you carve a path in your mashed potatoes and the gravy all flows down that path. <laughs> I love mashed potatoes too, Squeaks. And I love that scientists can learn things about weather patterns by studying rainy places like Mount Waialele. But it isn't the only super rainy place on Earth. The area with the most rain in one year is Cherrapunji, India, which got more than 25,400 millimeters of rainfall from the summer of 1860 to the summer of 1861. That's as high as an eight-story building. And that same town has the record for the most rainfall in 48 hours, too. In 1995, it got splashed with 2,493 millimeters of rain in two days. That's almost as high as the tallest person on Earth in just a couple of days. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Another nearby town called Masenram is really rainy too. Masenram holds the record for the highest average rainfall over 30 years, with 11,872 millimeters of rain per year. Both of these places are in an area that has a wet season and a dry season. In the wet season, they get massive storms called monsoons, and these storms bring in lots of rain. Right, so that means these places usually get most of their rain in one part of the year, instead of more consistently like the fort. The monsoon season happens for the same reason we have summer and winter here. As the Earth tilts, 
it changes how much sunlight hits the planet. When the sunlight is stronger mm -hmm. on the ocean, it makes more water evaporate. That means that there are more clouds, and those clouds get pushed over to the land by air currents. Good question, Squeaks! The monsoons are especially strong in this part of Asia because of the Himalaya Mountains. These giant peaks block any of the dry air from reaching the places that are the rainiest, so the storm clouds don't get pushed away anywhere else. All right. I'm sure the kids living in those really rainy places have lots of games that they can play, even when it's raining. And I have a craft in mind for us to do today. Let's make our own rain gauge so we can figure out how much rain we get for the rest of today. <laughs> for this craft, you'll need a tall, clear container with straight sides. An empty spaghetti sauce jar works great. You'll also need a ruler, a permanent marker, and some clear tape. Put a piece of tape up the side of the jar. Then use your ruler to make lines on the tape for every five or 10 millimeters. Seal in your markings by putting another piece of tape over the top. Then set your rain gauge outside in a place with nothing else above it. And wait. Once the rain stops, you can check how many millimeters of rain your area got. <laughs> Ooh, I'm excited too, Squeaks. Let's go set up our rain gauge outside and start measuring. What's wrong, Squeaks? <laughs> oh, I see. I'm sorry, buddy. They do look pretty dry. <gasps> oh, hi, everybody. Squeaks is upset because he forgot to water his plants and they've dried out. It hasn't rained in a little while here at the fort, so they didn't get any water on their own. <laughs> Squeaks says our friend Juniper told him his plants would need more water because it's so dry out. On the bright side, it won't be this dry forever. The weather will change sooner or later. <laughs> of course it will. The weather doesn't stay the same every single day. Remember a few weeks ago when we had all that rain? The area around the fort always gets a bit of rain and snow. We don't have a super dry climate. <laughs> no, not climate, Squeaks. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with climbing. Climate describes the weather in a particular place over a long period of time. Like whether it's windy or rainy, sunny or snowy. <laughs> exactly! We've had dry weather for a while now, but over time, the weather here will change. Unlike climate, weather is temporary. It isn't always dry and sunny here like it is now, right? <laughs> Oh, maybe it feels like it now, but it will change eventually. The climate here at the fort includes some sun, but not all the time. It also includes rain and snow. Those are weather patterns, and those weather patterns make up the climate. In fact, weather patterns let us guess what a place might look and feel like during certain times of the year. Right! We can guess that it will probably snow in the winter, but not the summer. I have an idea. Let's look at some places where the climate includes very little snow or rain. Let's take a trip way down to Arica, a city in Chile. The climate in Arica is very dry, meaning it hardly ever rains there. One time, it didn't rain at all for 14 years. <laughs> It is a long time, even longer than you've been around. Based on what I've told you, can you guess how much is going to rain in Arica this month? <laughs> right, probably not very much. But Arica is still near the ocean. We can find an even drier place if we travel away from the ocean and visit the nearby Atacama Desert. A desert is a place where the climate includes very little rain, and the Atacama might be the driest desert of them all. It gets only around five millimeters of rain every year. That's about the size of a pencil eraser. The Atacama is also one of the oldest deserts in the world. Parts of it might be 150 million years old. That's so old, dinosaurs were still around and would be for a long time. 
Squeaks wants to know why the Atacama is so dry. Well, there are a few reasons. One is that it's near some very tall mountains. Sometimes mountains can be so tall that rain clouds can't cross them. So those clouds can't bring any rain into the desert. Another reason is that the ocean near the Atacama Desert is very cold. The cold ocean means the air stays pretty cold too. And cold air doesn't have very much water in it, unlike warm air. So there isn't enough water to form clouds and rain. That means both the ocean and the mountains stop any rain from coming to the Atacama. Oh yeah, Squeaks thinks that the plants probably want rain pretty badly, just like he does right now. But sometimes in places with very dry climates, when they do get rain, there isn't anywhere for it to go. Once, when the Atacama experienced a lot of rain, they actually had very bad floods. <laughs> right, the people, animals, and even the land in dry climates get used to the dryness. Hey Squeaks, I've got a question for you. Deserts are often hot and sandy. But do you remember one very unusual desert that we learned about? <laughs> you got it, good job! Antarctica is a place at the very bottom of the Earth. And even though it's very cold and covered in snow, Antarctica is a desert. Being a desert is all about how much water falls to the ground. And water can either fall as rain, which is liquid water, or snow, which is solid ice. Some scientists think that Antarctica is just as dry as the Atacama. In parts of Antarctica, only three millimeters of water might reach the ground, even less than the Atacama. Oh, Squeaks thinks maybe it's not so bad here at the fort. At least it isn't as cold as Antarctica. Climates, whether they're dry or wet, can tell us a lot about a place. We know that Antarctica and the Atacama Desert will usually be pretty dry. A bit like the fort is right now, right Squeaks? Let's go get some water for your plants. Maybe we can still perk them up. <laughs> <laughs>